Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the so-called nuclear experts get it wrong. This week, we commemorate the 28th anniversary of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster in Ukraine with a nuclear hot seat special. We will hear from Chernobyl survivor Bonnie Kuneva, who as a teenager in Bulgaria when the accident began, still experienced the impact from the accident, both on her life and the lives of her children. We will talk with Dr. Janet Sherman, who edited the English edition of Dr. Alexei Yablokov's groundbreaking book, Chernobyl, Consequences of the Catastrophe for People and the Environment. There will be a brief interview with Dr. Yablokov himself from Dr. Helen Kaldikoff's 2013 symposium on the medical and ecological impact of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. And our latest edition of Voices from Japan makes the Chernobyl-Fukushima connection personal with a message from Ruichi Hirokawa, a Japanese photojournalist who was the first non-Soviet photojournalist allowed at Chernobyl. When Fukushima began, he knew exactly what it meant and what to do. All of these interviews will be coming up in this special nuclear hot seat. Today is Tuesday, April 22, 2014. The Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Ukraine in the Soviet Union was the site of a catastrophic nuclear accident on April 26, 1986. An explosion and fire released massive quantities of radioactive particles into the atmosphere, which then spread over much of western USSR and Europe. Radioactive particles from Chernobyl still circle the Earth as part of the jet stream, where it continues to be brought down to the ground by rain and snow. To create a picture of what happened at Chernobyl and its meaning to us today, I began the interviews with Bonnie Kuneva. She was a 16-year-old living in Sofia, Bulgaria, about 800 miles away from Chernobyl, when the accident began in 1986. She currently lives in the United States with her husband and three children. When Chernobyl happened on April 26th of 1986, where were you living? I was living in Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria. Bulgaria is a small country in the Balkan Peninsula. And typically on the maps of the Chernobyl um, uh, fallout, it's uh, uh, covered in gray, like if, if it didn't have any, um, um, it wasn't uh, affected. Unfortunately, the reason for that is because the government never allowed any tests and never any data uh, has been released about the impact, but the impact uh, uh, definitely has been devastating. You were living in Bulgaria. What, if anything, did you learn about Chernobyl when it happened? When it happened, uh, nobody of the ordinary people knew anything about it. It was kept as a deep secret as the communist government at that time felt uh, obligated to be loyal to the Soviet Union powers that be. And, um, of course, Soviet Union couldn't do anything wrong or make any mistake. Therefore, there was nothing going on. And then, uh, not only we weren't told, but when there were some whispers in the air, uh, the government, Bulgarian gov government, officially went on national TV and declared that there's no problem and we can eat uh, spinach and lettuce and drink milk and be outside. And we actually mandatory, we, I was a uh, teenage uh, girl at that time, were forced to march in a, some communist rally on uh, exactly the same day when there was a, a rain that was dragging down the nuclear uh, hot particles and basically the nuclear rain was raining upon us. How soon after it happened did you start hearing the whispers that something was wrong? Basically, besides occasional whisper, nothing really was declared until the fall of the communism in uh, 1989. So it was three, three years. years. and a half, yeah. During that time, were people aware of any changes either in the food or in health or in children? People observed uh, numerous changes. Um, the 
plants that spring all looked burned and uh, yellow and gray and uh, brown. Uh, some of the um, annual vegetables, especially the most sensitive, um, like spinach and lettuce I mentioned, were also brown and, and um, dead, some of them. Some of them just um, looking strange. Some of the um, lettuces actually grew huge, like three, four size, uh, uh, times bigger than the usual size. The next uh, a few summers, I actually was working in a farming community, and I heard from local farmers that they have observed strange changes in their baby animals. Every spring, all of them have their uh, baby goats and sheep and cows and horses, and then they had... Um, amazingly high number of animals either stillborn, born with um, uh, organs and um, limbs that are like multiple numbers, like five legs or two heads or just like missing uh, parts and um, I actually remember particularly uh, in 1988 I worked a little bit longer so uh, it happened that my birthday in September was uh, I was still working there, and the farmers were so sweet, they wanted to throw a party for me, and they actually uh, killed a baby uh, goat, and that goat had sex organs for female and male. And if that was a novel, that would be foreshadowing of <laughs> the future problems, because I heard from a scientist that the different creatures have different um, time of responding to radiation, and uh, uh, more primitive or sim simple organisms uh, mutate faster, obviously. At that time, I heard from a scientist that they expect the peak in the mutations in humans to occur 10 years after Chernobyl, which was exactly when my son was born. But um, apparently that even wasn't the, the most dramatic peak because according to the uh, recent statistics, the problems and the mutations continue even in a worse way uh, year after year. So we really don't know when the peak will be. How were babies affected by this? The babies that were born at that time uh, had uh, bo bone problems, problems, skin problems, uh, respiratory problems. You were talking before, uh, before we did the interview, you mentioned about a child that you knew who was born three days after Chernobyl happened? Yeah, that was my doctor. My son's doctor uh, daughter was born three days after Chernobyl. And even that doctor who was a medical personnel and very intelligent woman wasn't aware of what's going on. So she was exposing her daughter to the son, which is traditional for the area. Uh, and then her this is part of the health for giving the baby yes, vitamin D. Especially that um, uh, you know, winter time in Bulgaria is dark and cold, so you do need that exposure. Uh, yes, her her daughter's bones were literally melted, and she needed support for the rest of her life. Her um, bones after. were melted. Yeah, they, she, they were so soft that they couldn't support her body ever. And she survived? She survived with normal, uh, otherwise intelligent uh, girl, but um, disabled for, for life. Did the government continue to deny that there Absolutely. was anything wrong? Absolutely. The government continued to deny. There was no comment at all. Um, the food wasn't uh, withheld, so people actually were encouraged to eat uh, uh, food that was definitely contaminated. While later on uh, in uh, investigation, it turned out that the government itself had uh, deliveries with charter airplanes from New Zealand, special food for their, them and their families, and their families were in sh underground shelters. But uh, the ordinary people were actually sent to march on the streets for rallies and get all the exposure that was at that time the strongest at its peak. So, no, there was no officially released any information uh, besides the talk among people and uh, lots of jokes. Bulgarians like to joke on political topics. Tell, uh, me, some, so, tell me some Chernobyl jokes. Uh, grandson is asking his grandfather, hey, da uh, grandpa, tell me what, uh, what was it in Chernobyl at that time? And the grandfather answers, oh, nothing, nothing much, don't worry about it, and pat his uh, grandson on both of his heads. <laughs> yeah, I know it's bad. <laughs> we shouldn't laugh, but it's... <laughs> so, yeah, the grandson got two heads. <laughs> so, and unfortunately, that's the reality for that area. Uh, if you look at any documentary, you can see children with tumors as big as their heads or organs outside of their bodies. And unfortunately, it doesn't get better. If you look at the data for Russia and Ukraine and all these areas that were affected, uh, still it doesn't get better. Still people have all of these problems. Talk to me about what happened with your son. 
Well, uh, basically, when I turned uh, 24, I got pregnant. My husband at that time was also a mountaineer and uh, outdoor man, and he was exposed to the uh, Chernobyl radiation even in a closer proximity to the explosion. And I was marching in that communist rally <laughs> that was mandatory, unfortunately. You couldn't sneak out unless you wanted to get in a serious trouble. I was uh, young and healthy. I have no history of genetic uh, diseases in our family. Same with my uh, ex-husband. But um, our son was born uh, and immediately diagnosed with Down syndrome. And uh, the day he was born, uh, there were 42 or three kids in the hospital. Three out of them were Down syndrome kids, which is extremely high ratio of uh, down syndrome for the normal population. Right, the normal percentage is those, what? Those are all young uh, mothers. Uh, for that uh, age group, the normal uh, I, ratio, I believe, is one in 3,000, something like that. And Bulgaria used to be a clean country and actually was pretty low genetic uh, diseases. At that time, uh, with my son, there were three more babies in the hospital uh, with Down syndrome. Uh, that was a huge tragedy for, for all these uh, people because on the top of it, the country wasn't prepared. There was no such frequency of problems, mental problems or genetic problems. So there was no system of support, uh, no services available for them. And uh, these kids were really, really victims. So what is it that has shown up in your son? Well, uh, he is uh, severely mentally retarded. He has heart defect and uh, other problems that are related to the uh, genetic disease, like weak muscles, weak joints, uh, blood problems, stomach problems. Uh, also, I'm diagnosed, uh, di diagnosed with thyroid problems, immune problems. Uh, once in a while, tumors here and there, which are pretty benign, but um, m all of this actually, is, is, uh, according to doctors, is linked to the exposure to radiation because there's no history of any of it uh, in our family. And I'm pretty healthy person. I also was a uh, mountaineer. So, uh, all of these problems, actually, uh, according to the uh, medical authorities, are linked to Chernobyl, and actually my son officially is labeled as environmental case. By the governmental workers who actually try to get support for these kids. Even before I was... Um, uh, I, I got a son with Down syndrome. I was very dedicated to the environmental movement, and I was very aware that uh, we are not capable of controlling and using safely the nuclear power. So I was actually a fighter against it. We actually did um, protests every, every springtime, every 26th of um, April. We were giving black uh, ribbons to the pedestrians in Sofia, and we were doing protests. And there was actually pretty fun uh, rallies in which everybody was uh, dressed as a mutant. <laughs> so we were having fun with that. <laughs> um, but... Given a chance to tell people one thing, I want to uh, say this. I don't want to leave a message uh, about story about some strange girl with a Slavic accent who had an unpleasant experience with the bad communist, communist government, got screwed, her son got screwed, and then she somehow managed to come to America and uh, get a little bit better help for her and her uh, son. Uh, that's all great, but that's not really what I want to say. The communist governments were evil and they were capable of lying, but they're not the only uh, government uh, capable of lying. I'm afraid that in any situation, powers that be serve their buddies, <laughs> the people with power and money. And if big money is involved in uh, developing uh, nuclear power in any country, the governments will cover for them, and they did cover, as we saw uh, in the case of Fukushima. The information wasn't uh, released. We still don't know what kind of impact that uh, horrible event will have. I really am, I'm, I'm, I feel for the Japanese people, and I know that it has uh, had impact on America, too. So since uh, Chernobyl in uh, my country and in the whole area, the um, percentage of genetic diseases, stillborn babies, miscarriages, cancer, tumors, uh, respiratory problems, thyroid problems, uh, bone and blood problems are skyrocketing. It's epidemic. I talked to the director of the biggest, most uh, specialized hospital in Bulgaria who happened to be 
um, somebody I know. She said that miscarriages and genetic illnesses in Bulgaria are almost like considered like a flu, like something that almost everybody experienced, and this is not normal, and it's not okay, and it's not easy. I myself actually lost a baby uh, a few years ago, and this is a huge, huge uh, tragedy that uh, some people maybe never recover from. And we shouldn't uh, take it lightly. We should say, oh, that's the price for using nuclear energy. There are other uh, alternative sources of energy. We really don't need to play with that extremely dangerous energy that we really don't know how to, how to control and how to store the waste. And it's just really something that we should leave alone. What are your thoughts about what's facing Japan as a result of Fukushima? I'm seriously concerned about the what will happen in five or ten years with the kids who will be born at that time after Fukushima, the kids or the uh, kids from parents who have been in the area or the little ones who already have been exposed. Are they going to develop what kinds of cancers, tumors, um, headaches, bleeding? We really don't know. And uh, I feel for them and I worry about them and I don't think that that's how we should treat our future, our kids if, if, even if we are ready to play Russian roulette or Japanese roulette <laughs> we should give the chance to our kids to actually have a safe environment and enjoy their lives without having to deal with tumors and cancers and, and fear and pain and, and disabilities because even one kid growing with tumor or in, like in case of my son, intellectual disability and um, heart defects, he has huge impact. Their life is so much tougher and so much opportunities are taken away. It's like a curse upon them. They're, they're really robbed. This is a robbery officially in, imposed to them. And even one kid is too much if we're talking about impact of, of uh, such a negative event. What about million kids? What about million people? I've been told that most of the people who participated in the original cleanup are already gone. Cleanup of Chernobyl. Cleanup of Chernobyl. What about the cleanup in uh, Fukushima? I know that they s basically sent people who were sent on a suicidal mission, people who knew that... Basically, that's the end of them, and maybe they were really willing to sacrifice themselves. But why do we need to pay that price? We have alternatives. We have alternative sources of energy. We can learn to use less energy. We can learn to be less of a consumerist. There's options. We don't have to be slaves to the nuclear power and sell ourselves so cheap to such a dangerous business. Chernobyl survivor, Bonnie Kunova. Before we move on to the next interview, I want to remind you that Nuclear Hot Seat is in the middle of reconstructing our hacked website, and the work is not inexpensive. If you have ever considered donating to this program, now would be the time to do so. A secure link to donate via PayPal is available on our temporary webpage, nuclearhotseat.com. Whatever you can do to help, many thanks. This next interview is with Dr. Janet Sherman. She is well known for her work with epidemiologist Joseph Mangano on analyses of data after Fukushima that indicate a spike in U.S. infant mortality and hypothyroidism. She also edited the English translation of Alexei Yablokov's groundbreaking work on the book Chernobyl, Consequences of the Catastrophe for People and the Environment. Please note that this interview was conducted in April of 2013. So references to Chernobyl having taken place 27 years ago and references to her recent support with Joseph Mangano are now an additional year old. A lot of people have saying that we've, uh, when we talk about Chernobyl and Fukushima that we're, uh, we're scaring people. And I say, but you know, not everything was tested. Domestic and wild animals, fish, birds, trees, plants, fungi, insects, everything were tested. Many, many things were tested. And all of them showed in adverse effects after uh, Chernobyl. And none of them are sitting on a psychiatrist's couch, you know. So it's not psychological when no. there are mutations in butterflies and animals and there's radiation showing up in the boars and things like that. Yes, that's correct. And 
Also, uh, my colleague, uh, Tim Mousseau, has been to Chernobyl about 25 or 30 times, and he's been to Fukushima a number of times, and they're finding the same changes in the birds and the in- insects and the trees in Fukushima as they are finding in Chernobyl. And they, they too, are not sitting on a psychiatrist's couch. So we know that these changes are real, and they're persistent. In terms of Chernobyl, What are some of the changes? Certainly there was catastrophic exposure in the early days. But as it has progressed, what has been showing up now that we are, what is it, 27 years now away from the anniversary of it having happened? You know, in in Belarus, one of the biggest concerns is 80% of the children are not considered well. How do they define not well? Well, of various immunological problems, respiratory problems, um, birth defects, low IQ. And now this is, would be, you know, if some woman was pregnant during Chernobyl, this would be going into the third generation. You know, this is, would be a grandmother, you know, if she was like 25. And now, now we're talking about probably a third generation that is, that is uh, damaged as a result of, and in Belarus, which is, you know, having a terrible time, and economically it's in, in, in tough straits. So the impact genetically was not only on the first generation that got exposed to it, but you're saying that these are permanent mutations that have happened or genetic changes that have happened that are being passed down through the generations in Belarus. Well, n- not only in Belarus, but other places as well. I think somebody did, I can't remember who the, the, uh, the researcher was, did 20, uh, some generations of uh, wild voles, the O-L-E-S, those little creatures that look like a, a mouse, and they found that the genetic changes were uh, permanent throughout all 20 generations. I've wondered, with the genetic impact, if there are 20 generations of voles, they've just changed a little bit maybe they've adapted to it is such a thing possible adaptation to the radiation well there are people who think that there is such a thing but i don't I, you know i don't really know i don't think so how does the research that's been done on chernobyl relate to japan is it really a vision of what they are facing as a result of fukushima is it worse in japan is it happening more quickly or more slowly there Biology, chemistry, and physics are pretty fixed. If you look at the periodic table of elements and you know that strontium-90 is being released and you know it's in the same category as calcium, you know it's going to go to the teeth and bones. If you look at cesium-137, it's in the same family as potassium, and it goes to all the muscles and the glands. So it's not a surprise that these elements will have an adverse effect on living creatures, whether it's a plant, an animal, or a human. You can't change biology, and we know that it takes a certain period of time for an isotope to dissipate. It takes approximately 10 half-lives. So if you're talking about strontium-90 and cesium-137, they're about 30 years. So a half-life. Yeah, a half-life. So you're talking about three centuries, ten times three. That's three centuries. And these, this is immutable. This is, these are things that you cannot, you simply cannot change. And we know these things, and we've known them since the 40s. This is not new information. To say that, well, we really don't know what's going to happen in Fukushima is somehow or other either wishful thinking or trying to fool the public because once these isotopes are released, there's no getting them back. In terms of the human genetic damage that has been taking place, does it get worse through the generations? Is there any way to recover from it? I doubt it. We do know, for instance, that the children born to the the men and women who worked as, quote, liquidators, they were the people who cleaned, tried to, who were actually conscripted and brought in. There are over 700,000 of them. We know that the children born to these people turned out to be unhealthy. Many simply just died, and there were a high number of miscarriages or abortions just as a result of the the children were so defective. So is there a way to reverse it? I don't think so. I mean, you can't 
biology is, you know, pretty much progresses along a line, and it's hard to uh, hard to change it. For those who have survived, at least on the surface, from Chernobyl, mm-hmm. does it look like there will be long term survival? I mean, what we're, what we're facing here, I mean, this is existential, but it's also true that with radiation and with the long life of it and with its impact, it does seem as though what we're dealing with is the potential of certainly a change in the nature of life on Earth, if not a potential ending for it. Does it look like the people who have been impacted by radiation are going to be able to survive in the long run through the generations, or are we a piece of biological machinery that's in the process of wearing down to zero. Well, I hate to say it, but I think you're, you're it's correct. It is wearing down. And if you've got people who've got immunological abnormalities and kids who are born with either birth defects or hypothyroidism, as my associate Joe Mangano and I reported last month, these are people who are going to have to be on, the, the hypothyroid babies are going to have to be on thyroid medication the rest of their lives. So if you can't get the medication, you don't have the money, or you don't have the resources, or you don't know that you need it, then it's it's a disaster. Thinking that we can uh, release amount, large amounts of radiation into the biosphere and escape any harm is foolish. Whether it changes the wheat or the corn or the, the uh, you know other plants, we, we don't know, but it may make things much harder to grow, and we may be faced with very serious problems. I mean, what are you going to eat if you're in Japan and you rely on vegetables, which in around the Fukushima area was a very big agricultural area? And if you eat lots of fish and all the fish is contaminated, what are you going to eat? This is very, very serious concern. In terms of exposure to radiation... What is the biggest difference in relation to internal versus external exposure? Oh, that, of course, that is the, the critical one because the nuclear industry keeps saying, well, it's no more than flying across the country in a, in a uh, jet plane. But it's the, the whole issue is the taking into the body isotopes that go to various parts of the body, whether I-131 to the thyroid and cesium to soft tissue, including the breasts, and strontium-90 to the teeth and bones. This is the issue. Once they're taken into the body, they release, you know, alpha or beta particles and cause harm. Is there any way that we know of to remove radiation from the body once it has been taken in, either ingested or breathed in or come in through a cut or a wound? The only research that I know of was done after Chernobyl where they used apple pectin to decrease the levels of cesium-137. Now, whether they're doing this in Fukushima or not, I don't know. But it did seem to lower the levels of cesium-137. And getting children away from the milieu where they're eating contaminated food on a daily basis seems to help. Children were taken to the United States and other countries and seem to improve uh, when they were away for, you know, six weeks or two months. They used a gamma measuring chair so that the kids could sit in and measure the levels of gamma radiation that was mostly coming from the cesium. And they found that the kids' levels did decrease. But what do you do when you go back and you start eating the local food again? Is there any way known to remove the radiation from the food or from the water? Well, I understand that Japan has been trying to remove radiation from the water and then storing the water. And where they're putting the radiation they removed, I have no idea. But it turns out they're trying to store the water in plastic-lined pools. And, of course, we know that that's not going to work very well. And it's now running out into the ocean. And we're finding that even fish and clams and seaweed off the coast of um, North America are contaminated. What, to your way of thinking, is the best way to protect ourselves? I think the only way to protect ourselves is we have to close these nuclear power plants. We've had, you know, the the meltdown of Chernobyl, then of Fukushima, which is still really, it hasn't stopped. It's still releasing 
enormous amounts of radiation. Uh, it was about four days after Fukushima happened when Alexei Yablokov, the senior author of the book Chernobyl, came to the United States and stayed with me for five days. And he said, quote, Fukushima is much worse than Chernobyl and because, you know, the country is small, the population is very concentrated, the Fukushima area was a major agricultural area, and there's no place to escape. Now, Ukraine was big, and it wasn't a major, you know, it was a big grain-growing area, but it wasn't a, a, a small farms. He was here just before the Caldecott conference, and he said, there's going to be another meltdown. I said, where? He said, well, I don't know where, but there ha- just statistically speaking, just by chance, yes, there's going to be another meltdown. Now, there's about 400 reactors in the world and 100 in, in the United States. We don't know which one is going to go down, but just because of the age of these and the fact that accidents happen, it's going to be another one. And what are we going to do then? Well, we have close calls just about every week based on the reports that are coming in. And we keep ducking the bullet, but they're coming thick and fast, and there's no telling when that next one will land. You're absolutely correct. How did you come to work with Alexei Yablokov on the book, on this cornerstone book on Chernobyl? Well, it's like everything in my life. It was by accident. It must be about 15 years ago, a friend of mine had heard Alexei speak in New York, and he said, Janet, You've got to, you've got to meet this man. You've got to hear him speak because he's going to be in Washington next week. So I went to hear him speak and it was stunning. I mean, he was, was so interesting. And I went up and introduced myself and talked to him and we got to, to visiting and then we kept in touch. And I think it was in 08 he came here and brought me the Chernobyl book in Russian, which of course I can't read Russian. And he said, we need to get this into English. And I, kind of naively said, well, I can edit it. And I figured it would take me, you know, four or five months. Well, it took 14 months. And he said, we have no money. And I said, well, that's okay. You know, I'm retired and my husband has died, so I've got time to do something like this. So I did it. And that's how I happened to be the the editor. It's just by chance. And how has that book impacted What is the importance of it to researchers, to medical personnel, to governments out there? There was, you know, an enormous criticism of the book by the nuclear industry as soon as it came out. Of course. Yeah, but it encompasses over 5,000 articles written by researchers from all over the world. And it's the first time that literature that was published by people in Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine has been translated and available to English-speaking people, but there's articles in there from Greece and Israel and Germany, uh, Italy, Sweden, everywhere. I think the big thing is that it encompasses what has happened to so many species, not just humans, but so many species. You can't ignore the fact that this is worldwide, although concentrated more in Europe than it is in the United States or Canada. Now, here's a question that I've had for a long time, and that is that it seems that cancer used to be a relatively rare disease, but that since approximately the mid-40s, and if we think 1945 from Trinity through Hiroshima and Nagasaki, those were the first atmospheric releases of nuclear radiation and the radionuclides. Since that time through the years, it seems that cancer has first been slowly growing in its rate and now exploding exponentially to the point where 41% of us are expected to get cancer in our lives. While it may seem to my naive and non-scientific eyes that there is a direct correlation, as a doctor, as somebody who is experienced in this, What for you is the correlation between the increase in radionuclides and the ever-expanding rate of cancer in the world? I think there's a direct relationship. We know that cancer is not randomly distributed in any population, none. And a great deal of research has been done showing increase in cancer in proximity to nuclear power plants. A number of very good articles have been reported from Germany 
about children and leukemia in proximity to nuclear power plants in Germany. We also know that Busby's work shows an increase in cancer around the plants in the British Isles. My colleague Joe Mangano did a study of thyroid cancer in the United States. And men, women, blacks and whites, the highest cancer rate for thyroid cancer in the United States, guess where? You tell me. Eastern Pennsylvania. Yeah, downwind from Three Mile Island. Oh, my God. And southern uh, New Jersey. This is not data that we generated. This is governmental data. And the study that we just released on hypothyroidism in newborns in the United States is based on governmental data. We are using state and federal data. The federal government is doing nothing. The Congress, as we know, is probably never going to do anything. So, you know, we have, we have people wringing their hands, dealing with sick family members, and we don't, we know, some, we don't know everything that causes cancer, but we know a number of them we could do something about, and we do nothing about it. Let's shift over to the study you recently did about hypothyroidism that has been showing up in births on the west coast of the United States. How did mm-hmm. you come to do that particular study? Well, we we were just curious as to what has been the effect of of uh, Fukushima. Well, one of the things that's documented, every, practically every state, I think everyone in the United States, is required to test newborns for a number of diseases that can be, if they're treated immediately, can, you know, improve the lives of the kids. And one of the things that the states require is to test for thyroid function in newborns. So Joe Mangano, of the 50 states, I think he got data from about 45 of them. And we found that, again, it's not random. And it was higher in West Coast and, of course, in higher elevations because you have more fallout at higher elevations. That's the same for pesticides. You have more fallout in higher elevations and colder elevations than you do in warmer. Just because so, it's closer, it's closer to what comes down from the jet stream. Yeah, it's higher. It's yeah, it's a it's higher in elevation, but also coldness encourages precipitation. You know, we started looking at this and thought, "Wow, this is impressive." And of course, that was one of the things that occurred at the Marshall Islands. This is some of the work that was done by Rosalie Bertel where there was terrible hypothyroidism and actual cretinism in children born on the Marshall Islands after the uh, atomic tests. Can anything be done for these children other than keeping them on thyroid medication for their entire lives? That works. I mean, you've got to replace the thyroid. It's like if you've got a child with, you know, with insulin-dependent diabetes or a person with insulin-dependent diabetes, you have to take insulin. But it works. As long as the medication continues to be available and affordable and and can be accessed in a timely manner so that the supply doesn't run out. If a child who is dependent in this way is suddenly deprived of the medication, what happens then? Then they become hypothyroided and they become sick and they, you know, don't do well. Is it fatal? Well, if it goes on long enough, yes. You know, this is stunning information. I mean, we're killing ourselves. Right. I look at Japan and I say, this is a country that is committing genocide against its own children. It is destroying its own future to save the face of the nuclear industry, which doesn't deserve to have one. Exactly. I agree. So if you had a message that you wanted to get out. I mean, your information is superb. You've been doing this for years. If you had a key message to put out, what would that be? Would be, say, to mobilize every neighborhood. I mean, it's it's useless right now, I think, to start petitioning Congress or the president or anything like that. I would say in your neighborhood, mobilize your neighborhood to close any nuclear power plant that's within 200 miles of where you live. And get them closed down. And even when they're closed down, there's there's problems because you have fuel pools with these uh, spent, quote, spent rods, which unless they're kept underwater, 
are going to catch fire and release massive quantities of radiation. You know, this needs to be closed down, but unless people speak up and march in the streets and scream and holler, I don't think anything will happen. How do we get the vote for women? We marched in the streets. How do we get, you know, civil rights? We marched in the streets. And how did we get the Vietnam War stopped? The only way is to get the citizenry involved, and most people are just passive and are not doing anything. Either that or they're so overwhelmed by the details of daily life that they don't have any extra energy to put to this invisible, though ultimately life-threatening, power you're, source that is out there. You're absolutely right, particularly if you're taking care of a family member with cancer or a child with cancer. You're, you know, you're overwhelmed. Sometimes I just want to curl up in a ball, suck my thumb, and weep because yeah. I, I don't have any children, and that's the decision I made after Three Mile Island. But for the children who are out there, what kind of a future are we creating for them? What kind of a future do we have on the planet? And who are these people who think that by this short-term, greedy, irresponsible behavior – they are going to have a future line as well. What makes them think that they're immune to the consequences? You're right. You're absolutely. I don't. I don't get it. I mean, I really don't understand how people can can do this. You know, there's the Hippocratic oath that the physicians take, and I took it years ago. First, do no harm. And I think this. You know, if this were given to people who were managing the uh, nuclear plants and the whole industry, maybe they'd think differently about it. I don't know. But when you see such widespread damage worldwide, I don't know how we can, as a human species, continue to even use nuclear power. We don't need it. It only provides about 20% of our power. If you fly across this country and you see all the flat roofs that you could put solar on, and then you, you don't have to deal with long-distance distribution lines, you can put it on the roof of a Walmart or a Safeway or any kind of a store, feed the power right down into the building, or wind, which is now becoming very useful, I don't see why we have to, you have to have a nuclear, except that it supports an enormous industry. And there's a tremendous amount of money there in that industry. And also it supports the military-industrial complex because it provides the raw material for the bombs. Exactly. Why are we exercised about Iraq building a nuclear power plant or North Korea having one? Well, because every nuclear power plant can produce the fuel to make a bomb. Ah, we are in such a mess. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's why I'm saying people, if people want to do something, mobilize your neighborhood. Just mobilize people and say, we've got to stop this madness. Dr. Janet Sherman. The study on hypothyroidism in children born on the west coast of North America after Fukushima can be found on the Radiation and Public Health website, radiation.org. On the home page, scroll down just under the picture of RPHP supporters Christy Brinkley and Alec Baldwin and click on First Journal Article on Post-Fukushima Rise in Disease Rates in West Coast Newborns. I was honored to be able to interview Dr. Alexei Yablokov, at Dr. Helen Caldicott's Symposium on the Medical and Ecological Consequences of the Fukushima Nuclear Disaster. Dr. Yablokov has a rather thick accent, but I encourage you to listen closely to this brief interview that I was allowed to have with him. Tell us briefly what you shared with the audience about what Chernobyl has to tell us about Fukushima. Both Chernobyl and Fukushima became more clear. Uh, show us, if we count the consequences for public health, it looked like the existing norm and regulation, official norm and regulation, not enough to protect people from uh, negative consequences of irradiation. It's a big question why. I try to explain, it. we have a lot of explanation why. Because it's impossible to catch all radionuclid. It's impossible to precisely estimate irradiation during first days, first hours, first weeks, when level of irradiation 100, 
thousand million times less than it will be. But as a result, as a result of this, all of these difficulties, the existing norm, it existing safety regulation, it not safety, it not, it not enough safety. This is the main lesson from Chernobyl, and the same we we we, we have absolutely the same situation in uh, Fukushima. Also, maybe interesting, it's impossible to trust official declaration. Official declaration and industry representative, their logic, their logic to diminish, their, their logic, the natural logic to diminish any consequences. So what is, what we have to be answer for normal people, for society? We have no right, have no right to believe official declaration and have no right to believe, to trust industry. What consequences for society? It means that we need to create independent system for check radiation. Independent because we, uh, we have now a lot of nuclear power plant all over the globe. It means that every country, every society, which situated around the nuclear power plant have to have some possibility for independent measurement level of radiation. Japanese experience in Fukushima show that it possible. It was impossible in Soviet time in Chernobyl because it too secrecy, no money, so KGB, local KGB follows every people who who measurement. But in Fukushima, society, Japanese society show that it's quite possible to organize independent from state, independent from industry system for monitoring of radiation. It's a key problem, maybe key problem for safety life even in the United States. Because, look, two years ago, some German uh, scientist friend of mine show that even normal working nuclear power plant in some part of year released much more radionuclide than its average report average. Average is uh, very dangerous. Average is the uh, average temperature for hospital. It not protect person, not protect individual. We need monitoring every day because, for example, if every nuclear power plant uh, takes spent nuclear fuel and put, and th during this operation, normal release from nuclear, enormous, enormous, but when it's average for year, nothing dangerous, but it will be dangerous for people who happen just now, just in this, in this place, when uh, this operation released. So we need some independent monitoring. It's also a lesson from Chernobyl, lesson from Fukushima. Dr. Alexei Yablokov. To watch Dr. Yablokov's entire presentation at the Symposium on the Medical and Ecological Impacts of the Fukushima Nuclear Disaster, Search through Google under the terms Caldecott, Symposium, and Yablokov. Y-A-B-L-O-K-O-V, like Victor. When the Nuclear Hot Seat website is back up, we will post a link. What does it mean to find yourself accidentally in proximity to a nuclear accident? That's my personal story, and I tell it in my new nuclear memoir, Yes, I Glow in the Dark one mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and beyond. It's available as an ebook on Amazon Kindle. When you get to Amazon, just put in the title, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, or you can put in my name, Libby Halevi. This week, we present another in our ongoing series, Voices from Japan, uncensored messages from the people of Japan about the nuclear disaster at Fukushima. This week, we look at the direct connection between Chernobyl and Fukushima through the eyes and words of Ryuichi Hirokawa, a photojournalist who was the first non-Soviet photojournalist allowed to document the Chernobyl disaster. When the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster began, Hirokawa was in the first small handful of independent journalists to head towards, not away from, the site on March 12, 2011 the day after it began. In this interview, 
He tells us about his humanitarian efforts to help the children of Chernobyl and what he has learned and is now putting into practice to aid the children of Fukushima. I used to think that nuclear power was a peaceful, safe energy source that helped humanity. But then, in 1986, Chernobyl exploded. And in 1987, I began to research the issue. In 1989, I was the first non Soviet journalist. To enter the no go zone. I was able to witness the true face of the disaster then. People didn't have food to eat. They were living in fear of illness, and animals were exhibiting all kinds of abnormalities. From the following year, back in Japan, I started a humanitarian campaign for Chernobyl victims. I had heard that people were concerned about food safety, so the first thing I did was to send radiation measuring equipment for food. Next, I sent medical supplies. But the problem was so overwhelming that I realized we would have to concentrate our efforts somewhere, so I founded the Chernobyl Children's Fund, Japan. And focus on delivering aid to children. One of our projects was a recuperation program that enabled children from the disaster area to have fixed periods of rehabilitation. They could rebuild their immunity and strength in sanatoriums by eating safe, healthy food and relieving stress by having fun. We started the sanatorium program in 1990 to 92 after the local people sought our help. NGOs from Japan, Germany, and Belarus cooperated, and we have helped over 60,000 children since then. The program is about a month long, and our research shows that about 95% of participants have benefited from their stay. Another area of focus for us has been children affected by thyroid cancer. If you catch it early, thyroid cancer is usually not fatal. But I learned back then that the stalling tactics of the IAEA and various medical researchers caused many cases of thyroid cancer to go undetected until it was too late. So we built facilities where children could be screened to promote early detection and receive the medications they needed to take every day. We also invited these cancer victims to the sanatoriums for recuperation. When little girls grow up and become mothers, we have a program where they can come back together with their children to build their strength. Because of this experience, as soon as the Fukushima accident occurred, our first effort was to deliver food radiation monitoring equipment to affected areas. I have a magazine called Days Japan. I used it as a platform to fundraise, which enabled us to start six citizens' radiation monitoring centers in Fukushima Prefecture. At these centers, We have whole body counters, food radiation monitoring equipment, and independent thyroid screening. From our experience in Chernobyl, we believe that the best thing is to move children far away from the area. But if this is impossible, then it's best to try to build their immunity in recuperation centers. Presently, we have a year round sanatorium in Okinawa. Which is the southernmost prefecture in Japan. We started in July 2012 and we have welcomed 22 cohorts so far. Sometimes mothers of preschoolers accompany their kids. We hope that several year round facilities like this will be created all over Japan. It has been proven that recuperation is extremely important. Unfortunately, 
the government and industry have been pushing the idea that Fukushima is safe and that there is nothing to worry about. This kind of campaign makes it really hard to raise the funds needed to build sanatoriums. We learned in Chernobyl that the third and fourth year after the disaster were when the serious illnesses started to manifest themselves. It's three years after Fukushima now, and this is not the time to let our guard down. Please help us in any way possible. Japanese photojournalist Ryuichi Hirokawa. The link to Hirokawa-san's facility in Okinawa is kuminosato.net. That's K-U-M-I-N-O-S-A-T-O dot net. Click on the English tab for more information and a link to a YouTube slideshow. Since the information on the website for donations is in Japanese, if people want to donate, contact Voices from Japan co-producer Families for Safe Energy about how to make a donation. You can find Families for Safe Energy on Facebook. Today's final thought belongs to Bonnie Kuneva, who showed up at my doorstep unexpected this afternoon as I was editing this program, toddler daughter in arms, to tell me something that she thought was important that listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat hear. What I want people to remember is the fact that bad things happen all over the place and we are responsible to educate ourselves and remember that we have to take an active position and know what's going on and not hide our head in the sand and think that the problems will go away just because somebody else will take care of them. It's really important for everybody to feel responsible about what's going on. And in this respect, I believe that the way we can save our world is education. And I really respect what you do in that field. (laughs) It's very, very valuable and important. But I think it's everybody's responsible, not just people who consider themselves and dedicated themselves to activism. It's everybody's task and responsibility. One thing that I'm concerned with at this point in America is that the overwhelming availability of information becomes disinformation, and the media has very successfully have blurred the difference between fact and opinion. Now, a lot of people say, well, I don't believe in global warming or I don't believe in nuclear danger, therefore it doesn't exist or it won't affect me. Unfortunately, it's exactly the opposite. It will affect everybody no matter what they believe or if they believe. It's important in this place and time to remember that our planet is very small and the technology is making smaller and smaller. And unfortunately, our ways to destroy become more and more powerful. And if we grow technology without growing moral, we'll manage to erase ourselves as a species. Chernobyl survivor, Bonnie Kunova. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, April 22, 2014. Voices from Japan is a co-production of Nuclear Hot Seat and the Families for Safe Energy team. Translations by Beverly Finlay Kaneko, and many thanks to our terrific crew of voiceover actors. Special thanks again this week to Sean Arklight and Christine Dillon Strickland for their ongoing help in posting Nuclear Hot Seat each week during our website meltdown. To Richard Viasana, the Mexico guru, who continues to help me sort out the tech problems. Hopefully we'll have website by next week. And Joshua Breitag in Australia for his post-hacking reconstruction and security advice. Nuclear Hot Seat theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV. We're now on three times a week, including a flashback random replay on Tuesdays. Our archive remains available on iTunes, or once we get the website back up, it will be on nuclearhotseat.com slash blog. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2014, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed, as long as you give proper attribution to the website and email and my name. This is...